Greetings, science fiction and fantasy enthusiasts. Do you read books? Do you watch films? Do you hate deodorant? Then welcome to our podcast. You're listening to No Deodorant in Outer Space with Ryan Sean O'Reilly. Now, let's get started. Are they alive? No one knows. They make themselves now. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly, and joining me once again is Richard Mel, aka Rick. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Good. This is the second half of our podcast where we are covering the movie version from the short story Second Variety by Philip K. Dick. We are going to do the movie Screamers, which was directed by Christian Duguay. I'm not sure how you pronounce that name. I think I probably pronounced it incorrectly. Probably. <laughs> so let's just get right into it, and we'll start off with our opening comments. So I'll give you my opening statement for this episode on the movie to just sum up my thoughts about this film. So I'm going to say, this lesser-known B-movie effort falls just short of cult status, tracking decently with its fun PKD source material, but there are enough choice bits for science fiction fans to enjoy. What about you, Rick, if you were to summarize your thoughts on this movie? Yeah, I guess I I, I would consider this um, kind of like a uh, a top Canadian production, not really a B-movie, but... Um, huh. Yeah, it had some memorable moments in it, and I think they really capitalized on some of the imagery from the story second variety cool and can i just pause you not pause you but just ask you for a second um uh, i'm hearing a bird chirping in the background what do you know what that is or are you just sitting outside on your porch well, that would be a bird chirping in the background do you know what kind it is <laughs> uh i think it's just like a um i don't know blue bird possibly bluebird okay is it sunny out by you yes it is oh nice it's kind of like gray over here over in the Midwest, you're all the way out on the West Coast. Is it? It's sunny, and what's the temperature like out there? It's sunny. It's probably thirty. It's forty-one degrees. Oh wow! Yeah, it's a little warmer today over here too. But wow, you got birds chirping and everything. Wow, it's nice. All right, cool. Okay, so this movie was directed by Christian Duguay, who I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly. This director, I didn't find a lot about him. He's continued to work since he started, but he hasn't done a lot of like major stuff, and there just wasn't a lot written about him. Also, I think he's French-speaking, so I saw that there was interviews in French where he was talking, but I don't speak French and can't understand it, so I didn't get a chance to listen to those interviews. Like, I could only find some like uh, print articles that were in English. I only checked out a couple of those where he commented but he was born march 30th 1956 he's still alive and uh the one article i saw from tribute.ca and and then wikipedia it noted that he's a canadian director he was born out of quebec he's a graduate of concordia university's film school where his student films won awards like many directors he started off doing different things in film he was an editor and director of photography working in documentaries around the world for tv for a few years initially then he returned to Canada to work on a French TV series as a second unit action director. After that, he worked on an American and Canadian miniseries about quintuplets called Million Dollar Babies that starred Bo Bridges. And following this, he worked on some feature films as well as more television shows. His main films that he's noted for, uh, as far as big films, are Screamers, the one we're covering now, which starred Peter Weller. And that came out in 1995. And The Assignment, which starred Ben Kingsley and Donald Sutherland, who was in... Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which we covered on this podcast. Uh, and, and Peter Weller was in Naked Lunch, which we did previously. Uh, mm-hmm. This assignment came out in 97, and he also did The Art of War, which starred Wesley Snipes, which came out in 2000. That seems to be the last big, like, I don't know, Hollywood thing he's done. He did some, uh, he did a bunch of television miniseries or TV movies about various topics. A lot of them were nonfiction. He did one on Hitler. Some documentaries, right? Yeah. Not just, not only documentaries. I think some of them were like historical fiction. Like he did one on Hitler, one on St. Augustine of Hippo. He did like a Joan of Arc series. He did one on human trafficking, um, one on Pope Pius VII. 
He's also done work on commercials. I saw a Variety article that said as of August of 2018, he was going to be directing the third season of Medici, which is a Frank Spotnitz effort that is on Netflix. Frank Spotnitz was the, I think, show creator, at least for the initial series of Man in the High Castle for Amazon. I think he then left after that. So that's the latest for him. As far as the production of this movie, I thought it worth noting that this was a script written by, I think the gentleman's name is Dan O'Bannon. So he wrote the screenplay for Second Variety, which became Screamers. And he also wrote or worked on the screenplay for, we can remember for you wholesale, which is the short story by Philip K. Dick turned into Total Recall, which we covered on a previous episode. So he worked on these in the 1980s, but they weren't made for into films for a while. Second Variety got optioned early in 1983, but like nothing came of it until like the 90s after the screenplay was rewritten by a gentleman named Miguel uh, Tejada Flores, who is one of the writers listed on Revenge of the Nerds and for additional story material, according to IMDb, for The Lion King, among many other listed of authors on The Lion King. So he wasn't like a major writer, I don't think, of The Lion King, but he had something to do with the story. Hmm. But Dan O'Bannon, who wrote the first script of this before it was altered, is known for writing like Total Recall, and also he's the writer for Alien, the first Alien movie. So he's very well known for that. And he's done other stuff since then, like a lot of other movies that became big. But that's essentially what I saw about the director and then what I kind of noted about the production costs. I don't know if there's anything you had to you wanted to add or comment about that, Rick. No, no, you're good. <clears throat> All right. So Screamers came out in 1995 from Columbia Pictures. It starred Peter Weller, of course. I saw, I, I sent you a link for this. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. I saw an article on io9 kind of talking about the, the movie and, you know, some of the differences between this movie and the short story. And, and I, I, let, me, let me ask you, Rick, like just off the cuff, what, what are the things you noticed that were like different than the short story? Um, there was a, uh, a, more of a sense of, uh, coherence, I think in the movie than in the, uh, in the story. Uh, that was like the major difference I thought probably because, uh, I mean, it's just a little bit more tangible with video and, uh, acting and all of that. And I, I don't know. Uh, I, that's my only thought really. <laughs> well, okay, I- I'll get into it. Like, this article noted that, like, you know, instead of being about, like, paranoia from the Col- Cold War, it's more like, they said it was, like, pre-Y2K paranoia, but it's not It's not about the Soviets and the uh, UN forces. It's between the alliance, who are, like, workers, and the corporate NEBs, who, I guess, like, the owners of this mining colony. And it's not set on Earth. It's set on Sirius 6B, which is like a, a mining colony off Earth. I believe there still was like fighting and stuff on Earth. Or actually, I don't I don't remember if there was. Yeah, I think there was, right? But I mean... <laughs> I don't know. We should be characters in a Philip K. Dick book, right? <laughs> well, the whole, the whole movie takes place on Sirius 6B. And it looks the way you'd picture from the story, how Earth would picture, because it's all blown out and devastated. And there were, it's sort of pretty close to the story in a lot of respects because it starts off in a bunker and there's like a soldier coming towards them who in the the original story was like a Russian soldier but now it's like someone from the NEB who is like he looked Greek he looked Greek (laughs) okay but he was someone from the NEB was just supposed to be really it's like the evil corporation that controls the minds there's a lot of backstory the movie opens up with a big scrawl of text that you have to sort of slog through it's read to you but it's a bit much to start off the movie, I think. I wish they would have just got rid of that. It also opens up with, uh, they call him Hendrickson in the movie. He's a little different than he is in the book because he's a fan of opera. And it starts off, Peter Weller is is, played, is playing Hendrickson. And he's like listening to Don Giovanni opera. And uh, he is looking at like old, like 
Roman coins or something like that and examining them. For some reason, he has like old coins from Earth and he's just like looking at them like that's his hobby. Right. He's got like the scholarly, you know, thing about him, right? Yeah. But he's still a major, like, or whatever, like, in, in charge of this bunker. There's indications that, you know, that this unit is sort of out of touch with the happenings on Earth. But the the, the, the soldier comes, and I think they're they're going to kill him, but then they the, the claws end up killing him. But he still has a message saying that they want to meet and talk. And so... Hendrickson decides to get authorization. Sorry, there's like a bell ring in the background. That's my bird. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, it's listening to Get me. Excited. Podcast. <laughs> um, so they Hendrickson decides to call back to Earth to find out what they should do about this overture for peace, right? He talks to like a I don't know, like a general or something like that, who tells him, Hey, yeah, we found th- I guess the mining county is mining some kind of special resource. It's just like something that can give power. It's like better than radioactive material or something like that. It's some kind of like fuel source, right? Isn't that what they're after? Uh, I thought it was like some kind of uh, control on the land so they can mine or... Right, but the, uh, it, there, there's a resource there in that point. the mining company. Yeah. Yeah. But when he talks to the general or whoever that is back at Earth, they're like, yeah, you know what? We can possibly negotiate for peace because they found more of this resource on a different planet. So we don't have to fight anymore because there's, like, plenty of this stuff around. Then everyone's all happy because they're like, all right, we're going to go send someone out to, to go talk to the, the NEBs and negotiate this peace. But then, for some reason, a spaceship that wasn't supposed to be there is asking for permission to land at their base. And doesn't he, like, tries to deny permission, but the, the spaceship crashes anyways? Yeah, right. It crashes in. And so when they go to see... And, and then this causes all kinds of havoc because this movie, there are claws. They call them screamers because they make, like, a screaming noise. Uh, and st- you know, when, when they're coming around in the dirt. And with this ship full of people landing there, like, these claws are going to come out and start killing things. Because all they do is look for someone's, like, heartbeat or something like that. They go to look and see what's going on with the ship. They find one survivor, and then they find out that the ship, which is supposed to be like a transport ship, supposedly, is full of, like, weapons. And it has, like, nuclear weapons on it, right? Mm -hmm. The guy that they find kind of claims he doesn't really know much about it. He was just, like, on this ship, and they were going to this other planet. And then he tells them that the general that they supposedly talked to that gave them permission to negotiate peace with the NEBs is actually hasn't been a general for a couple years. I don't think they say he's dead. I think they just said he was, like, fired. Yeah. So the so then it, it is, like, a kind of like a Philip K. Dick story because then it's all, like, they had this conversation. Who did they have this conversation with? Because this guy supposedly is not in charge anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there was this environment of uncertainty once more. Yeah. And also, like, what's with the spaceship that crashes that's full of weapons? I think the guy did say they were they were going to – he was on his way to that other planet where there supposedly was more resource. And he's like, no, there's no more resource over there. We're, like, fighting over there. We're fighting the NEB over there or something like that. So then huh. Peter Weller's character is just like, screw this. I'm going to go negotiate peace with the NEB myself because no one's being straight with us. And no one cares about us all the way off on this planet. And for some reason, he decides to take this guy, the survivor from the spaceship, maybe because the guy is like a witness and can tell and can testify to what he knows. Mm-hmm. And just like the book, they he sets out to go to the other bunker, to the, the you know, the head bunker. Well, I don't know. Why don't you take it from there, Rick? Like, what happens next? He, it's kind of similar to the book, right? He runs into the David robot. Yeah, very much. Except he's got a companion this time. He's not alone because he's got this other soldier with him. Oh, yeah, that's one difference there. Uh, Well, they do run into the David on their way over there. The David gets blasted. Yeah, just like in the story, like they go to the other base and they get shot and they're like, hey, look, it's a robot. Yeah, out of all of the the variations that happen between the story and the the movie, the the one constant is that these little children, the the boys, they just get blasted. So that was something that they they felt like they needed to uh, (laughs) carry forward. Yeah, yeah, and it's all it's it's a good scene. I mean, it's just good for shock value, right? Yeah, it's um, jarring. Yeah, it, it, you know what? So um, <laughs> let me stop you right there. For some reason, sure. when they leave the base, and I listened to another podcast that noted this on the Venganza Media podcast, I believe, the now playing movies. For some reason, they play some kind of crazy music 
that's like totally out of step with the rest of the movie. I feel like it feels like it's like an '80s song or something. Oh yeah, yeah. I did pick up on that. Like on their way out from their barracks, from their bunker. Yeah, it's like the, it's like they, they play they... like this sort of like <laughs> uplifting, you know, '80s glam rock. Yeah, it's like they almost uh, like should be like slapping five and like putting on their shades as they head to the other are like army base yeah there's like there's like a, an element of of like swag between um hendrickson and and his uh counterpart on their way out uh on this mission and this this soldier who's with major hendrickson he's um he's got like these sunglasses on he's strutting around um and uh yeah we later find out that the sunglasses are like virtual reality glasses and he's just kind of he's just kind of you know daydreaming basically with these things on. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So that's different than the movie, and that character's not in. The, or that's different than the story, and the, that character's not in the story. Yeah. <laughs> so they go. So, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, just, I'm done. So Nothing they, to say. They deal with the NEB soldiers, and there's three of them. Just the two guys and the girl, but the girl is not a prostitute. Now she's like just like a black market, like a uh, smuggler or something. She has like booze. She gives them, but they, they have the same conversation sort of like they go underground. But the thing is in this movie, like when they're underground, it seems like they're in a vast complex. Whereas when I was reading mm-hmm. the story, I felt like they were in like a bunker, like a tight cramped bunker with like not a lot of rooms. I don't know if that's the I impression. felt the same way. Yeah. yeah. And I liked the story better for that. Hmm. Like I didn't like that they were in this big vast complex underground. Like it just, I liked the feeling like claustrophobic. And like hiding underground in like a hole and like not knowing what the heck is going on in the surface. This felt like more just it, it felt less claustrophobic and I felt like less tense because yeah, of that. right. I mean, they I mean they did make the uh, the scene pretty dreary and everything was just sort of in ruins. But yeah, I I, I felt the same way in, in the story. It was more close quarters. And in this movie, it's yeah. like this larger complex, right? So they have uh, some degree of um, mobility there. In, in in the book, you just felt like they were like sitting ducks. Uh, right. It's not not quite the case in the movie. Right. And like similar stuff happens. Sandrickson goes off and talks to the Tazo character, whatever her name is in the movie. And then he comes back and the one uh, NEB soldier shoots the other one, right? And then they he's got blood and guts and they're like, Oh, he's not, he wasn't a robot. You shouldn't have done that. Whatever. And the same thing, right. They decide that they need to go back to his base because his base could shoot him. Or I think, I think that guy got stabbed in the movie. He wasn't shot. Oh, maybe. I can't even remember. now. I think he got stabbed with a knife. Could be. Yeah. And it was just sort of like this, uh, you know, it wasn't really eventful, but yeah. Yeah. For, for some reason, the one character who ended up being, a humanoid claw for some reason he just seemed to have like this chip on his shoulder the whole time very aggressive and uh yeah in the movie he just Klaus had like this um this complex about him which you don't really yeah he's very arrogant yeah introduced to in the in the story you know it's, he's just a guy in the story in the movie he's he's an asshole yeah it, it, he's like sort of like almost like two dimensional and you know Philip K. Dick doesn't really well, yeah. f- flesh out his characters a lot, but I feel like there's so no. much go- going on with his stories that you still get intrigued. But like when they made an effort to flesh out this character and make him an asshole, I just I didn't feel any more into the story because of it. He, se- he he just seemed like a caricature. Yeah, I mean, he's just kind of like this gung ho soldier with a with a teardrop tattoo on his face, and you know. You don't really. You're not really emotionally invested. I mean, when he dies, it's not that big of a deal. It still. It still comes at like the uh, price of, uh, uh, like a plot twist or a shock. But yeah, you know, if you're familiar with the story, then you know this guy's gonna go soon. So yeah, I do like Peter Weller's character and and the way that Peter Weller gave his character um, personality, flushed him out fairly well. Yeah, I agree. I, I like Peter Weller's voice. He's always he's got like that commanding sort of voice. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. He, he's just he's he was good for the role. Yeah, he he does a good job. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. <laughs> Robocop. How can you not like him? So they go back to the base. 
the Davids come running out and attack them. I think they did some pretty good visuals with that, that whole fight scene. Then they end up fleeing. They end up going, they go down into the base and they're kind of like fighting around, um, figuring out what to do. And then I forget what happens next. You see, you also see one of the claws, like you see these different, another version of the claws is like, kind of like you see some like stop animation version of the claw, like this kind of like dinosaur reptilian looking thing. That's got like spinning mm-hmm. blades. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah. And there's more like trust issues between them that, yeah, what they, they must've really spent quite a bit of money on that stop motion animation to, present the claws i mean that that really kind of took a lot of time there yeah it's just odd because i you know it seemed like they just kind of threw money at something that really didn't need to (laughs) well that's a good really deserve the investment (laughs) i i really liked that part of it but i i kind of agree with you because like the claws are humans and then the other claws they show are the underground spheres which essentially are just like they're not animation they're just some kind of like effect that they're doing with like I don't know, some something with the dirt, right? So they didn't almost need to spend money on that. No, they didn't need to go to the extra length and they just I guess they found the extra money in the budget and they were like, Well what the hell do we do with this? Hey, well let's uh let's make like these um two hundred and fifty thousand dollar effects, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So the characters that, fi- that, that, that's why I disagreed with you that this is not a B movie, just because of the these like unexpected special effects it was uh, a little bit over the top i thought well i thought the effects were good in this movie for the most part there's i think well, there's yeah. a, there's points where they're like i was happy with the claws but there was points where it, it, it did maybe it started to show a little bit when they did like um some of the explosions or cgi stuff it, it got a little bit um took me out but for the most part i thought it was pretty impressive and i liked it and it was sort of charming like a b movie uh-huh you know, I'm trying to think what happens next. So then they go, um, I know that there's like, they struggle with this, this clause and the, the add on character ACE protects one of the NEB soldiers with his special wrist tab, but then it doesn't work in the claw. I think it's up killing that the soldier and right. Yeah. His, his counterpart, right? Yeah. Is that, and, oh. yeah. And then, so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't we'll remember a, what happened. We'll we'll, little, you think he died? Yeah. Well, it ends up they all end up dying, and, and at some point they got to get to the spaceship to leave the planet. And at this point, they're not going to a moon base; they're going to go back to Earth. And then here's where the story changes because the Tazo character, which I think is she called Jessica in the movie, she uh, sure he's worried that she might be a robot because. Um, Right at the end, he has a final fight with his old best friend. In in the book, okay, let's backtrack. When they head back to the human base, they have the scene where they're going to go to the base, and um, he's trying to talk to the base and tell them to come out. And they're like, "No, come down." He's like, "Come out." Hendrickson's character, the, you know, played by Peter Weller, is like he does a test, and I think this is a, a point where the movie was bad because in the story, you have Hendrix talking to the base and saying come out i order you come out and his friend the lieutenant or whatever is like no just come down he never has like a real conclusion of what's going on but they're pretty much sure that something bad's going to happen and then it does in the movie we have backstory that peter weller likes opera and he uses that to test his friend in the base because he's like he calls him you know he's like let me talk to don giovanni and that's who he was listening to earlier and then they put on a supposed Don Giovanni to answer his transmission. So then he realizes, okay, the base is overrun because Don Giovanni isn't there. It doesn't exist. It's a musician. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like by doing that, they sort of ruined some of the suspense of that moment. Cause like he's able to kind of verify for himself for sure that the base is overrun. That's not a hard verification, but yeah. Okay. More so than the book. And even though in the book, I think they were still suspicious, but I just, I don't know. I just thought it was, it was clever how they, t- I mean, I saw what, I appreciate what they did to tie it together and create more backstory for that character, but I was like, ah, oh, this is kind of, it ruins some of the uncertainties of it, of the, of the yeah, tension they, from the I story. They, right. And. They missed out on the suspense and the opportunity for suspense. Yeah. And then he goes in there and eventually he does run into his old best friend and, and now he's a claw. So 
suddenly we learn that the claws are able to not only self-replicate, but they can make whole new models based on other soldiers that are, are present. And that's not in the story, yeah. right? The original story, they're just like models. They're varieties. You have the, the woman one. You have the, the boy one. You have the wounded soldier one. You have the Klaus one. But now we have, you know, the, the, the claws able to, like, kill someone and then make a robot out of them. Like, no, oh, why the hell not, right? I well, mean, it makes sense. Dick, Dick does the same shit, right? Well, I don't think he really did in the story. That, that doesn't happen. He didn't do it in the story, but he kept on coming up with these evolved claws. Uh, True. So, I mean, if, if they can change and remanufacture themselves so quickly, then why the hell not? If it adds to the to the suspense factor, then why not just go ahead and do it? That was the one character in the, the movie that Major Hendrickson just sort of hit it off with, and they had like a friendship. So, right. You know, I guess if you thought that the guy was cool uh, as a viewer of the movie, well, now he's a cyborg or humanoid and, you know. I guess for me, I hated that part. Who cares? I, yeah, I, I, it's a letdown, right? But I feel like it's just like a, it's an obvious way to go and they took it and it's just like, eh, you know, I've seen this a million times. Like, you know, the best friend becomes evil, like whatever. You know, I think this Dan O'Bannon guy, he worked on screenplay for the thing that john carpenter remade and i don't know if there was stuff like that going on there too because i think some articles talked about how this movie is kind of like the thing and like total recall and other things that he worked on and maybe even alien but i didn't like that part and then i also didn't like the other thing is he has a jessica robot when hendrickson realizes that jessica is also a robot he it, it, it's kind of a cool thing they do first because first he stabs her to check if he, she's a robot. No, he cuts her. He cuts her hand. He doesn't just stab her. To check to see if she bleeds, so then he knows that she's a, not a robot. But then more of her come out, and he realizes the robots have advanced to the point where they can have blood and guts, and, and they're not just going to be gears or whatever. She is another robot, but for some reason, there's a version of her that's good now and is trying to help him, and then, and then there's other versions of her that are bad. That's also not in the story. I don't know if, how you felt about that, Rick. I didn't really care. You didn't care? I, no. I, I, mean, look, I didn't like it. They're, they're allowed to just pull anything out of their hats. Uh, yeah. Dick does it all the time. Uh, any way they can do something that will make the movie more interesting, they have full right to do it. Sure, um, they have the right I, to do I, it. I, just, uh, I was just, just kind of waiting for the movie to get over with at that point. <laughs> Well, I mean, then I guess it didn't work for you because it didn't make you more invested. I think it was meant to make you more invested and to maybe give right. Peter Weller a love interest that he didn't need. But to me, it was unsuccessful. And it's interesting that Philip K. Dick chose not to do it because I think he, in the story, he does indicate that the, the robots are evolving. They're changing and eventually they're going to they're gonna take on the bad qualities of man and they're going to fight each other. And in this movie, they do evolve and fight each other. But this movie is also indicating the robots are going to have the good traits of man as well. And so that takes on a different tone now because Peter Weller character basically says like, Oh, or she says like, she's learned to love or whatever, which is like, I don't know if we're getting into like what happened in Blade Runner or something like that. I think I heard a podcast mentioning that, but I, I don't know. I just thought it was like unnecessary and kind of just another thing that they did that didn't, it made the story less otherworldly, less, there's a certain coldness to Philip K. Dick's stories that is alienating and yet makes them very enjoyable because it aids to the unsettling narrative that he's developing. And by having a, a robot like sympathize with you like that in, in this story, and I don't know, maybe he did it differently in his other stories, but in that and having the best friend really be a robot flip, it made it more personal and less alienating and just less disturbing somehow for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't make sense because maybe it should make it more disturbing, but I, I didn't think so. Interesting. I mean, what I didn't really get into in the book episode is in talking about Philip's biography that I talked about in, in the book episode, you know, him feeling sort of displaced by when his mother married his aunt's husband and he felt displaced by the, the gentleman's twins and Phil's own issues with trust, like having his stories changed when he was writing for the Pulp sometimes. 
and you know his own paranoia and like later in his life he gets visits from the FBI and all that trust is a big theme in in, in this story and a, a lot of his stories and there's all these elements of betrayals and stuff present in this narrative you have the warring sides whether it's the NEB and the alliance or the Soviets and the Americans not trusting each other's you have these you know these claws these robots who they make and then they don't even know like they can't even control them once they make then the the, the claws evolve beyond their control which like that's a lot, loss of trust you have the claws tactics against the humans creating humanoid robots that trick the humans then you have the uh, elements of distrust in the bunker when the soviet or neb soldiers don't trust each other and fight amongst each other and then you realize that the claws themselves the robots the screamers they're also fighting each other and not trusting each other and nothing is settled and nothing is certain and then you have you know occasional tr- you know th- like in this movie you have the alliance soldiers on Sirius 6B not trusting what they're hearing from earth because they think they're just being used these are all just like strong themes like throughout this story and narrative there and there's stuff that's Phil K Dick is very good at exploring the ending of this movie ends with the character not having the robot giving the spaceship to the robot and having her go off to the moon base right and and then realizing he screwed up and he doomed mankind however he still does screw up right because it turns out there's a teddy bear that's I don't think we saw it got placed on the spaceship but we see this. I don't, te- know, I don't know how it would get in place, but yeah. Yeah, there's a teddy bear, and the last thing we see, it's like a typical like horror movie thing because we see this teddy bear, and we know it's from the David robot, and then all of a sudden we see the te- teddy bear start like getting up and moving, and like it's like alive, mm-hmm. and and we realize that that's you know a, a screamer or a claw or whatever, and he's bringing that back to Earth. So that is sort of similar to what the the, the, the tone, yeah, the tone that the short story ends with. Mm-hmm. What what happened to Jessica at the end of this? At the end of the movie, I forgot. Uh, Did well, she die? The one, the bad Jessica that comes, he turns, he starts the takeoff sequence of the spaceship. And for some reason, it's got to like burn off some ex- excess yeah, fuel. fuel. Right. So it like flares off before it take off and burns her. So she's done. And I can't remember the good one. Did he, was, was she hurt by the bad one and she wasn't going to survive? So then he's like, oh, I got to go on my own then. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah i can't quite remember it must have been that the bad one hurt her and she wasn't going to survive but uh, well yeah because i know her dying words were like i learned a lot of things like i i almost learned to and then he finishes her sentence of like love but he was going to let her go and then he realizes that she's a robot as well because the bad one comes and then there's a fight and so then in the end she's she is dead because he puts himself in the spaceship if she was alive, there would have been seen with her like staring after him or something like that. But I'm, I'm, she died. I'm sure. Yeah. Yep. So, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's pretty much all I have on the movie. It's only like ninety minute movie or something. Why don't we? If there's anything else you want to get talk about, otherwise we can just like give our star ratings and uh, final comments. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I just thought the movie uh, kind of fetishized the Davids getting just blown away. Like all, like there's a scene in the movie where all these Davids are pouring out of the the base, and they're just getting mowed down by all these um, these futuristic weapons. Yeah, and it's just it's quite a scene, just because it's like all these young boys getting mowed down in a movie. Yeah, I mean, what movies have that kind of situation going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think in that respect, the movie does deserve some kind of like cult status just because it's so unique a concept and they really just sort of blew that out of the uh, the water there. But I thought the movie was more entertaining than the story, so I'm just going to have to go ahead and give it three stars. Oh, okay. It's not like the best movie, but yeah, it, it was entertaining. How did you feel this movie compared to other movies based on Philip K. Dick books that you saw? I mean, you, you definitely, you know, I think you've seen Blaine Rudder. And, um, I think, that, yeah, there's... there's uh, Total Recall and things like that. Well, like like you said, Ryan, there there's uh, always this theme of trust, right? And not knowing what the actual truth is. And 
yeah, the, the truth is like a, uh, it's, it's always morphing, right? In, in his, in his stories. And this movie once again reflected like one of his, um, his trademarks. Do, do, do you feel like, I mean, I felt like they do stay true to his story in a lot of ways and they made some changes, which I didn't necessarily like. Does this rank well to you is like compared to like Total Recall or did you like, you know, or, or Man in the High Castle or did you like this way more or way less? I, I didn't like it as much as uh, Total Recall. I thought Total Recall was a great movie. Yeah. At least a four star movie. Man in the High Castle. I mean, that's just a whole different kind of. It's not exactly like an action movie or right. a series. Right. But it's it's more of like an espionage movie. Yeah. Totally a different set of circumstances, but the th- same themes run in all of these movies. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's this idea of allegiance and not really knowing where to go to to be safe, right? And not knowing if if the side that you're on is the right side to be on, and you have all these questions, right? And uh, that really kind of um, reflects reality and, and real life a lot more than these idealized stories, right? So, I mean, I, I can appreciate Dick like that. It, it It's just, you know, when you sit down and watch a movie, though, you kind of want to be spoon-fed something with a happy ending and with with something that was inspired by Philip K. Dick, you're necessarily not going to get that. It's, yeah. It's more possible you're going to get the exact opposite, which, I mean, it's, it's a good... It, I like unconventional things. This is unconventional. Overall, I, I do appreciate it, but uh, I guess I just, you know, if I'm going to turn the movie off and feel good about like what I just saw, then then I would rate the movie higher. But I mean, this had another sort of like dismal end, and uh, yeah, you know, I I'd rather have the thing so- served up as a uh, a conventional story with a happy ending, but it just wasn't like that. Do you, do you think that someone could or should take this source material and make another version a different way that would possibly be better? Or do you think, like, this is probably as good as you could make the source well, material? Th- th- they've made other versions of this movie. I mean, look at Terminator. That that was it's probably the well, biggest... I mean, uh, elements uh, of it. Uh, elements of it. Yeah, th- there's some major elements that were translated to the Terminator. And, and then I don't know if those are... I don't know if one inspired the other or not. They might... I can't... I don't know the dates of Terminator... That that movie really stuck out with me as being directly inspired by this this kind of story. I don't know if there were any other stories about robots and AI taking control and uh, decimating humankind, but Terminator really kind of took that to the next level and made it a whole franchise. Okay, so Terminator... That, that's been done. I mean, if, if you're going to try and make another version of this movie... It's already been done with with the Terminator series. Yeah, I mean, term, the Terminator movie. I think the first one came out in eighty four, so that predates this movie. It predates this movie. Yeah, so 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 that movie probably inspired this. Well, I mean, yeah, it might possibly. Have. Well, I mean, no. Well, O'Bannon was probably writing the script for this before Terminator came out, actually. But I mean, yeah, whatever. I mean, they they made what like four Terminator movies. Yeah, there's a bunch, but the first one came out in eighty four. And, yeah. o- and O'Bannon wrote the script for this in 83, but then someone else rewrote it, and this movie came I, I out think, later. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, but there's this movie, I think. I mean, is yeah, this. Go ahead. I mean, I think I heard a podcast mention like Tremors. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, that, if you've ever seen that yeah. movie. Interestingly enough, that movie Tremors comes up when you search for Screamers yeah. in Amazon. Well, you see. So get, it's like you see Tremors and Screamers, and it's all about like these underground. Yeah, yeah rodents that that eat people but i don't know like the, the whole underground like worms thing sort of yeah. turn off i i think they should have just gone straight to humanoid uh robots uh i don't know mm. it's just they just don't seem as exciting as um humanoid fighters but i i, I like whatever. i like the robot aspect of it more than the, the humans turning on it but i i realized that the having the humans robots was necessary to have all that distrust which was probably my most favorite element even though it's like pretty typical of dick to have that very typical yeah Yeah. i i also would give this movie three stars 
like I said, it's, I think anyone who's in science fiction can enjoy it. And especially anyone who's like a fan of Philip K. Dick, it's, it kind of adds to his canon of material. I know Weller, Peter Weller said like that. That's why he agreed to do this is because it was a Philip K. Dick story. And he was a, I don't think he considers himself a big science fiction fan. I don't think, but he was a fan of Philip K. Dick and just wanted to be part of his canon. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, cool. there's been so many, so much stuff made of Philip K. Dick stuff. You know, I think it's almost like guaranteed you're going to make a certain amount of money just by using his source material. I mean, that's the reason why I wanted to look into this because it was a Philip, it was based on a Philip K. Dick story. Mm-hmm. But all right. So on that note, I'll invite everyone to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast or TuneIn Radio or Stitcher or or anywhere else you can get podcasts, including on YouTube. Write reviews. Appreciate that. Our website is at www.nodeodorant.com. And that's about it. Anything else you want to add, Rick? Uh, no. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. Thanks for coming on once more. I appreciate it. So until then, we'll say good night. Good night. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode, or to read our show notes and find us on social media, visit nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. The theme music for this podcast was written by John Doyle from the band I Decline. You can visit him at i-decline.com. Voiceover for this podcast was provided by me, Margaret O'Reilly. Well, that concludes our episode. We hope you've learned a lot. Again, thanks for listening to our show. And always, always remember, there is no deodorant in outer space. All right, test, test, test. I have wave files. What, you, Rick? Let me hear you. Me too. I got it. Uh, I'm sorry. And you did say you have wave files, right? You're all good. I got it, yeah. Okay. And you got the blue mic or whatever selected. Yes, I do. Paranoia from the Cold cold War. Okay. All right. I'll just get into it. (coughs) So, Screamers... (coughs) Excuse me. You know. uh, (coughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry.